Good evening, folks. Are we working over here? Can you all hear me, or do I have to use my outdoor voice? No, we're good. All right. Welcome, and thank you for coming to the third annual induction of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism Hall of Fame. We are super excited about this year's class. My name is Rafael Lorente, and I'm the dean of the Merrill College. I still have trouble saying that. <laughs> Fourth day of my 10th month. Not that I'm counting. Um, we received more than 30 nominations for this year's class. And there were so many left from before that the committee that did this had to pick from about 100 people, a little more than 100 people. So I want to start by thanking that committee, because um, this was an unenviable task to pick five from that group and one uh, faculty member. So I'd like to thank students Kaylee Fox Shannon, Emily Condon, Aidan Thomas Hughes, and Joey Chen. I'd like to thank uh, faculty members Christoph Mergerson, who is here, and Kevin Blackestone. I can't see without my glasses, so I'm not sure. Um, also, Journalism Alumni Network board members Catalina Mejia and Nairi Berry, and Board of Visitors members Chris Freitz and Aton Horowitz. And there's Chris. So thank you all. Somebody asked me earlier, what's the criteria? And I completely froze and said, I don't remember. Um, but they have to be really awesome. <laughs> and I have nothing to do with it, right? They tell me afterwards. So you'll hear more about each of them momentarily. But our alumni inductees include an Emmy Award winning sports journalist, a Pulitzer winning reporter and editor who is now the night chair in data journalism at Arizona State, an Emmy winning TV reporter and anchor who now hosts a popular weekday show on Minnesota Public Radio, an award-winning broadcast journalist who also spent nearly two decades working at Merrill College, including directing the Capital News Service Broadcast Bureau for more than a decade, and an award-winning author and syndicated personal fi finance columnist for the Washington Post. Our faculty honoree is former dean and the first female dean of color at the University of Maryland, the great Dr. Lee Thornton. Lee passed... Lee passed away in 2013, but we are thrilled to have a number of her family members here with us this evening. Merrill alum Adrian Freeman will be accepting the honor on Lee's behalf. So this year we decided to do something a little different, because you all don't want to listen to me talk forever. We decided to let each honoree choose somebody to induct them. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podium Merrill alum and former Merrill broadcast instructor Chet Rhodes. We'll introduce Bonnie Bernstein. Oh, I forgot. Hey, so I messed that up. Bonnie told me her parents were going to do it. Sorry, Chet, we love you. But, but we have her parents to do it. <laughs> and, and for the record, Bonnie told me earlier today, and I forgot. So I'm running stairs tomorrow on a bad knee, right? Come on up. And as far back as I can remember, Bonnie has always been the dean of So it's great education, a great journalism school and a great gymnastics school. And at the University of Maryland, she received four more. So for her to receive such a high honor is truly amazing. And we are just so happy. Thank you. Bonnie told me my time is limited because she knows how much I love to talk, so I'll make it quick. As a parent, one of the things that we all aspire to is to have a child who we can be proud of. In the case of Bonnie, we are very proud. Uh, she has reached levels 
far beyond what we ever imagined. And she has made us so proud. And we thank Maryland University and the people that made this thing possible. We are very, very proud. And thank you all. God bless. First of all, mom and dad, you rock. That was awesome. Thank you for being here and being for my parents. Um, we all drove down together this morning from New Jersey, and I, I thought about the day I had the epiphany that what I wound up doing was what I wanted to do. And um, so we're in a judgment-free zone here, and you'll understand why in a second. So I think I was 12 or 13 years old, and mom and dad took me, my sister, and my brother to a Mets game. I told them I was going to the bathroom. Translation, I decided to check out every inch of Shea Stadium. It was a different time. It was very safe. They had no idea. They, there's no responsibility there. And, and I stumbled upon what was called then uh, the Diamond Club. And inside the Diamond Club, there was the 1969 Mets World Series trophy in all of its glory. And then at the back, I saw this seemingly very important person standing there in my little 12 year old self walked up to them. I said, what are you doing? He said, um, I'm a security guard. I said, what are you guarding? He says, I'm guarding the press box. Me being the ever curious one. I said, what's a press box? And he led me into the Shea Stadium press box where I stood in front of the seat where the writer for Sports Illustrated was working that day. And I watched the Mets take BP. And I said, I want to write for Sports Illustrated one day. I had no idea that that little girl with a big dream would be standing here today. And thank you so much to the Hall of Fame committee. I know you had a very difficult job and I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Um, Sue, Sarah, Angela, Michelle, how awesome is it that we are the first all-female Hall of Fame class here at Merrill? Pretty amazing. Um, my appreciation, though, I, I think first and foremost about being up here comes with the understanding that we are truly a byproduct of the sum of our hearts. None of us can do what we want to do, stand on stages like this, make our dreams come true without having a support system and champions and, quite frankly, people who keep you humble and hungry. Many of those people responsible for my foundation are in this room. And I, I, I'm going to try not to cry because it, it means so much to me. Chet Rose, who many of you know, he was the person responsible for my pivot from dreams of being a print journalist to a broadcast journalist because when I was surveying the students when I first got into the, the J school, I said, what are, the, what are the cool classes to take? And everybody said, you have to take Chet Rhodes' Journalism 360 class, Angela. I see you nodding your head because you know. And it opened a world to me that I just didn't realize existed. All of the creative elements of broadcasting that were just so enticing to me. Chet, we haven't been in touch for a while. I'm so grateful that you took the time out of your day coming over um, to be here today because you're, you're such a big part of my foundation. My legendary gymnastics coach, Bob Duke Nulligan, and his wife, Chris, are here. Um, Duke, first and foremost, put academics in front of athletics. If you've spent any time in the sports sphere, you know this is not always the case. Duke, thank you for coming to practice early, staying late when my journalism classes conflicted <laughs> with workouts, 
Thank you for taking the team van my senior year when we were on a road trip against UCLA and UC Santa Barbara and driving me around to the TV stations to meet with news directors, which in hindsight I know is an NCAA violation, but <laughs> we're in a circle of trust here. Um, Duke and Chris, it's wonderful to have you here. Dana Bradford, my soul sister, gymnastics teammate. Um, Dee, you don't know this, but when I blew out my ACL freshman year, I was told my career might be over. And it was, for a 19-year-old to that point, the most difficult thing I had ever gone through. And I actually thought about leaving school and going home. Dana, my teammate, Diane, their support, their energy, their encouragement, their love, you're one of the big reasons why I stayed here, and I have uh, no idea what my life would have been if I left Maryland and took a different direction. So, Dee, thank you for being here. Um, and of course, my parents, you only needed to see them for two minutes to know how amazing they are. And people always ask, how did you develop this love for sports? Because there weren't a lot of people who looked like me doing what I did when I started out. They assumed dad was a sports fan, and he was. But my mom, I kid you not, is a human sports ticker. And not only is she a human sports ticker, I can't tell you how many conversations I had with her, particularly early in my career at ESPN and CBS. When, when you start to get to the top of the mountain and you hear people saying women shouldn't be talking about sports, women don't know anything about football, women should be barefoot and in the kitchen, go make me a sandwich. My mom never let me lose faith. And my dad came to every sports event. I kid you not, he might be the only person left on the face of the earth with a VHS machine, and he taped everything I ever did. Um, the faith that my parents put in me um, is so important. So I hope that the people I've shared a little bit about with you today help you understand how incredibly important my foundation is. I am so proud to be Merrill Maid. I am so proud to be a byproduct of fearless journalism. I am so proud to have served on this board of visitors since 2005 and seen this school grow and evolve and the magnificent things that our students do here that is not just recognized locally or regionally, but nationally. Our students are a beacon of light at a time when our industry is under attack. And, and I guess I'll just close with this. Um, for the journalism students who may be here or for our teachers and professors who will be able to relay this message, it is so important to, before you get out in the work world, to learn to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. If you are doing your job right in this business, people may not only question your work, but they will attack your integrity. And you may find yourself questioning, why am I doing this? And if and when those circumstances arise, I would encourage each and every one of you to lean on your inner circle, trust your gut and your heart and your North Star, because I can promise you that being at Merrill Maid, you will leave here with a rock solid foundation. Thank you so much. I think now that we know Bonnie violated NCAA rules, I don't have to do stairs tomorrow. <laughs> so there's one more curveball here, and that is that um, our next uh, honoree asked me to introduce her, so I'm not introducing uh, uh, someone to, to come up. Um, there's a chance that I'm going to cry. Some of the people don't know that I'm kind of a crier, so I apologize in advance. But our next honoree is Sarah Cohen, night chair at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Did I get that right? Let's start with the big stuff so I can get to the important stuff. Sarah Cohen is a 2002 Pulitzer Prize winner in investigative reporting, and I quote, for a series that exposed the District of Columbia's role in the neglect and death of 229 children placed in protective care between 1993 and 2000, which prompted an overhaul of the city's child welfare system, unquote. 
that all by itself probably gets you in a Hall of Fame. But Sarah's a lot more than that. Sarah is a consummate journalist slash teacher. A couple of highlights. Sarah, as I said, currently holds, holds a night chair at Arizona State, um, where she leads their data journalism efforts and works with our great po partner, ASU's Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. Sarah has been a reporter and editor at the New York Times, the Washington Post, St. Pete Times, and the Tampa Bay Times, back when we were sort of competitors. Um, and Sarah, is, Sarah was Knight Professor of Practice at Duke University, and she was past president of the Board of Investigative Reporters and Editors, and for two years, the training director for IRE, which means she went around the country teaching journalists about what they called back then computer-assisted reporting. And of course, Sarah's one of our master's graduates. I think that's enough of the resume stuff. What you may not know is that Sarah, along with a couple faculty members, Sean Mussend and Deb Nelson, who's here, and a few others, bears some responsibility for this college being one of the top data journalism programs in the country. You see, Sarah was a student reporter in the Washington Bureau of Capital News Service in 1992. Sorry. Okay. Um, she covered business and I covered politics. So while covering the Senate and presidential races in Maryland, I got hundreds of pages of campaign contributions on paper from a dot matrix printer at the FEC. <laughs> For those under a certain age, they were noisy, unreliable printers in an age when you could still smoke in an airplane. Sarah, a student with her own beat to cover, patiently sat me down on my own little Mac Classic that I had just bought, and taught me how to use Lotus 1, 2, 3. Again, for those of you who don't know, it's before Google Sheets. Um, it was my first data journalism story. And I went home, and my then fiance and I typed thousands of these things into a spreadsheet, and then fact checked. Went through all of them. It was my first data journalism story, and while I never became a full-time data reporter or won the Pulitzer Prize, I never stopped thinking of data as a central part of how I did my job. And that's why it's so easy for me to see data as a central part of what we, of how and what we teach and how we run most of our large projects. When Bonnie talked about sports journalism here, Go look at the Howard Center and the Povich Center's website and see the sports projects that the students here do. They'll tell you what the score of the game was last night. They'll also tell you who paid for it, who bought it, who's cheating, and something else. So they're doing all the other work as well. But this story is a story that encap encap encapsulates who Sarah Cohen is. She is a lifelong journalist. And she's also a lifelong teacher. She's also one of my dearest friends. Congratulations, Sarah. I am proud to say I learned a little something from you. And I'm going to remember the award this time. I'm going to keep it short because Raphael's clearly more comfortable in being the center of attention than I am. But um, I did want to mention, when I first walked into the graduate program at, um, at, at Merrill, which was then called University of Maryland, I had been working in the government for a while, and I used to read trade journals as a part of my job. You know, Oil Daily, Furniture Today, Citrus news, all kinds of stuff like that. And my, my, my fervent hope was that if I spent a year at school, maybe I could go work for one of those places. And it took about a year, a year and a half, being here at the University of Maryland for the great faculty and staff here to convince me that I could probably get those jobs, but maybe I might want to look at others as well. And the training that we got in that bureau at that time um, in the Washington Bureau and also in the classroom has made all of the differences. 
I could have been in a velvet coffin for my entire life without the University of Maryland. So I have nothing but I'm just so grateful for the experience that I had here. And also grateful for my great husband who has put up with me moving around the country while he holds down a, jo a regular day job. So I want to thank him. For that. But um, it's an intimidating thing to be with this group of women, and it's it's so so much of an honor, and I really appreciate it. Thanks. So it's now my honor to welcome to the podium Dushan Drew, president of Minnesota Public Radio and husband of Angela Davis. An amazing night. Um, this is so cool. I actually, uh, as a former night current, I remember learned a thing or two from Sarah as well. So I'm thrilled to, to just be here tonight. Um, Angela is my partner in life, and uh, we met almost 30 years ago. Um, she came to the local chapter meeting of the Twin Cities Black Girls Association in, in uh, Minneapolis. We were both uh, in our mid-20s. I was at the Star Tribune. She was coming to town to work for KCP TV, the ABC affiliate in town. And uh, what I remember about Angela from our uh, first engagement, and I was dating someone, she was dating someone, but I remember thoroughly like her warmth and her smile. Great radiation of energy, great positive spirit. Um, fast forward a few months, and those relationships ended, and we were both avoiding dating anyone too quickly, and so we formed a two-person book club <laughs> where we, we actually read the books and talked about them. It's not a euphemism. We read the books and we talked about them. But in the course of doing that, we actually got to know each other. So I got to push past the smile and past the warmth to you know the heart and the smarts and the passion and the talent and the aspirations she had to, to, to really not just have a, a meaningful career but to have an impact on the communities that she lived and worked in. And fast forward another year and we got married. And as I said, it's been now almost 30 years. Um, I've been riding shotgun with her. And over that span of time, uh, I've just watched her blossom. She was always talented, always hardworking, but just to be able to see the impact she's had, not just the award she's won, um, the resume stuff's not important, not unimportant, but just seeing the way she has, um, both through her television career and, and now uh, hosting a daily call and talk show on NPR, really formed community. And I'd say um, the biggest gift that she provides to our community now, she helps Minnesotans better see and value each other more deeply. This community, you can imagine, you probably have your idea of what Minnesota looks like. You're probably wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's way more diverse and way more complex than it was certainly in 1993, 1994 when she moved there, and speeding in that direction. And she's helping us see each other more clearly and value each other more deeply. And so about four years ago, um, I became a boss at NPR. Um, so between nine and five, I'm, I'm in charge, but 24 hours a day, I'm grateful for you, for the work that you do, both um, through the journalism, but also the spirit you are in, in the newsroom and in, in the organization, your, uh, your warmth, your encouragement, the amount of mentoring you've done throughout your career makes us a better organization and um, really proud of you and grateful for you on so many levels. And thanks for the kids there in the back. Come on up, Ange. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, and I would like to congratulate the fellow inductees. Uh, congratulations, everybody. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, day. It's, it's so odd to sit in a room where you see people from all the different um, periods of your life all in one place um, and at a time, you know, when you're on your college campus. It's just, it's a lot to take in, but it's a good feeling. Uh, this is such a meaningful moment for me, 
um, because I look out into the audience, I can see the faces of so many of my family members. And if you think about the definition of family, family means a lot of different things. Um, my family of origin, members of that family are here, my, my aunt, my uncle, lots of my cousins. Thank you for being here. Some of them out in the lobby. Thank you, cousins, uh, for being here. Sorry you didn't make the reserve seating list. I love you. Um, I have the family I created, who you just heard a little bit about. Um, my husband, my son, my daughter are here. I have my chosen family, which includes my neighbors who flew in from St. Paul, Minnesota, to be here with me tonight, as well as my friends from my college years are here. Don't talk too long to them. Don't believe all the stories they will tell you. <laughs> um, I want to dedicate this award to my late grandparents, um, Earl Davis and Edith Davis. My grandparents raised me on their farm in Southern Virginia. My grandmother taught me how to read before I started kindergarten. And in doing that, she set me up for academic success that carried me through elementary school, through high school, through college. Um, my grandfather, who was a minister, taught me the meaning of kindness, humility, and resilience. So come on, Daddy. Thank you so much. Look what you did. You, you raised a Hall of Famer. <laughs> so thank you to them who I carry in spirit with me every day. So, My message today, my brief message, is really for the young adults who are with us tonight, uh, watching us, uh, streaming us live maybe, and who are here also in attendance. Uh, many of you are college students, including my son and my daughter who are currently in college, a junior and senior in college. I wanna share with you what I have learned about fear. So if you've spent any time on this campus, you've seen the word fear. Um, as my fellow Maryland Terrapins know, our college mascot is Testudo, the turtle. I love Testudo very much. And he is known for um, sharing, sharing his motto, Fear the Turtle. Um, and all across campus, uh, even in all the construction, you're going to see banners and signs and posters that say, you know, uh, move fearlessly forward, be fearless. And I just want you to know that I have always viewed fear as motivation. Fear can propel you into excellence. Um, had I not been fearless during my journalism career, I would have listened to the people who questioned my abilities and my potential rather than listening to my own inner voice. Had I not been fearless, I would not, I would not have accepted job offers that took me to states and places where I knew no one and didn't know the culture, but where I would soon make friends who would become like family. Had I not been fearless, um, I, 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 would have, I would not have quit jobs that no longer challenged me to search for new ones that allowed me to grow. And to our young people, let me assure you, when you are questioning yourself and wondering you know, what is next or feeling anxious, I want you to know that you have what you need. I look back at the 20-year-old version of myself. I always had what I needed. I just couldn't see it. You have what you need to accomplish your goals. Just be willing to ask for help and be willing to accept help when it comes. There's always someone available standing in the gap to get you to the next place. Um, one of our honorees tonight, another inductee, is Michelle Singletary, who is um, a person who stood in the gap for me and continues to do that today. So thank you, Michelle. There's a, a popular saying um, in the African-American community, I am my ancestors' wildest dream. Well, as I stand here tonight, I can also say that I am my own wildest dream. Thank you, Merrill College, for um, honoring me and for recognizing my dedication to journalism. I so appreciate it, and I want you to know I'm not finished. Um, as I tackle the next chapter of my career, please know I will do it fearlessly. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome to the podium 
Merrill alum, longtime sportscaster and member of the Kentucky Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame, Carl Nathan, to introduce Sue Copen Katz. Dean Lorente and honored guests, thank you so much. Most of you who are here tonight have never met me before. If you knew me, like some of my friends that are here, you would say I'm a man of few words. I just, you know, dead air is something that in radio, I, I could never think of the next thing to say. Sue knows it's different. So anyway, I was supposed to be a little laugh, a little introduction. <laughs> Jay, would you write some better material for me next time? I will indeed be brief, dedicated, caring, nurturing, loved, respected, and admired by her students, fellow faculty members, professional colleagues, and former classmates. A pros pro. I met Sue Copen Katzif more than 50 years ago when we were classmates here at the University of Maryland College Park and working together on the campus radio station WMUC. Sue continues to be a distinguished journalist, true to her craft, and an inspiration to all. Reciting the list of Sue's previous local, regional, and national awards would keep us here all evening. More succinctly stated, this outstanding woman sets an example for all of us in how she gives back to her chosen profession and in the many ways she honors this great university. It is with tremendous pleasure and a real privilege for me to introduce you to this newest member of the class of 2024 inductees into the Merrill College of Journalism Hall of Fame, Sue Copen Katzer. I've been thinking about this day since Raphael called me, and what the heck am I going to say? I'll start with thanks to Carl for some incredible words. I, I hope I prove worthy. Um, congrats to my co-inductees, Bonnie, Sarah, Angela, Michelle, and my former colleague, Dr. Lee Thornton. Thanks to my family, many of whom are here, my brother Michael, the other Sue Copen, uh, my husband Bill, my sister Harriet, my brother-in-law Sam, and uh, my son and his fiancée, who unfortunately were not able to be here. My extended family, Jay Kernis, Peter Doherty, my WMUC family. A lot of them are out there as well. Um, my Merrill family, this is my home. And there are so many students here who have become friends after having had them as students. And I am honored. I mean, some of them came from some distance. Um, and I know one of my WMUC friends came from North Carolina. One of my former students came from Minneapolis. Um, the biggest thanks, oh, and my parents. I cannot forget my, my late parents, who supported me um, in ways that I could not have imagined if because I chose a career that was a little uncertain. I was... Some of you know this. I was actually going to be a nurse. I was a volunteer at a local hospital. I was a candy striper. Remember that? Um, I spent a summer at Baltimore Sinai Hospital between my junior and senior years of high school doing nurse's duty. There were 20 of us selected from around the country. And, um, and, and you'll appreciate this. I thought nurse's hours were really terrible. <laughs> 
a seven to three shift. Who wants to work at seven in the morning? So I end up working radio morning drive at 4 a.m. You know, you have to find your passion. And my passion is the person who is my biggest inspiration, my, my foundation to becoming a journalist. And I always try to make certain I speak of her in, in ways that I can only begin to honor her. She was my journalism advisor from seventh grade to my senior year of high school. Her name was Suzanne Gehring. She is still around. I've tried to reach out to her. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to connect with her. She was um, an amazing person who believed in the possibility of students who can do real journalism. Two quick examples. And she led by example. Uh, recently, I found a photo on my desk in my office at home. It was a winter photo of a couple of students. I was there, heavy coat. There were some, there was clearly some kind of a labor action. And I grew up on Maryland's Eastern Shore. So it, it was kind of businesses with labor actions were sort of unheard of, at least in, in my history. So I couldn't figure out what this was all about. I did a purge of my basement this past weekend, at least a start of a purge. And I turned up the newspapers, including the one that had an article. Apparently, Mrs. Gehring um, chaperoned several of our, us reporters to this job. Well, it was a strike. And she made certain that at that age, certainly, you want to have an adult there. She let us learn by doing, by example. It was absolutely incredible, number one. Number two is a little more interesting. Our newspaper was dependent upon what the school could provide for us in the way of funding. We wanted to be independent. I think this was my senior, yes, it was going into my senior year. So I decided I was going to try to change school policy. This would have been at the county level to make that happen. There were only two high schools in my county, and they still are only, there are only two high schools in Caroline County. So I could have gone to the principal, right? Because that's supposed to be the chain of command. Ultimately, we would have to go to the superintendent. But I'm a journalist. So I'm like, forget that. I made an appointment with the superintendent of schools who agreed to see me, who agreed to hear me out. Um, with my parents' blessing, with the support of my journalism advisor. So my, my, I know my brother doesn't even know this story. I'm pretty certain. So soon thereafter, you know, that was the days before text messaging and email and whatever. So they called my house. The superintendent has agreed to change the policy. And I'm like, I'm going crazy. So I knew that would affect the other high school, and, and we started selling ads. But I go to school the next day, or I believe it was the next day. I have never been called to a principal's office before. And I was never called to a principal's office afterwards. I got the summons. What on earth could it be? So I'm going down to the principal's office. I sit there, nervous, of course. And he starts talking about going through the proper channel when you want to have a, something done. He never mentions what has happened. Because I know full well the superintendent has already informed him this is happening. And I'm going, so when are you going to get to the part about how you're upset? Never did. So I leave there thinking, the hell? You know, um, he vented. I got what I wanted. And we achieved a major change. It was one of those sort of learning opportunities. If you don't have the right person who believes in you, who gave me the leeway to learn how to do that, to go to the top, it helped to build my foundation for my many years now in the journalism field. So I will conclude with the lesson learned is believe in yourself. Don't be afraid to go to the top for the answers you need to reach. And don't be afraid of going to the principal's office if you get the call. Many thanks to all of you. Unlike Sue, I spent pretty much fifth grade to the end of 11th grade either in the principal's office or the dean's office. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, University of Maryland engineering alum, 
and husband of Michelle Singletary, Kevin McIntyre. Introduce Michelle. Um, this is a real pleasure. Um, I get to uh, introduce a person who I think is really remarkable. Plain columnist and a never-ending source of just great financial information and advice, my wife, Michelle. Um, so first of all, I have to start by saying this feels a little bit like a full circle moment for me because, um, and maybe for Michelle as well, um, we first started dating uh, as students here on the campus. Um, we were both desk receptionists at Upton Hall, which is just on the other side of the hill, on the other side of the stadium. Uh, so, um, you know, there's sort of a winding, circuitous path to get here, but um, not all of it pretty, but just know that the fact that I'm standing here means it all turned out well. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a as one who, um, sort of witnessed Michelle's career growing from almost from the start. Um, it's both incredible to me on the one hand, but then on the other hand, not really surprising that um, she's reached this level of success and recognition with this very prestigious uh, honor tonight. Um, I'm not a journalist. Um, I'm an engineering major. I do read the papers though. Um, but um, honestly, Michelle's professional uh, CV really speaks for itself. Um, I came to realize just how great uh, a columnist she was um, when we finally ran out of room on the walls and on the bookshelves uh, and for and in some of the closets for all of the awards that she was bringing home. Um, and so we're still finding places to put these things and we've got a little bit of work to do here. Uh, but it's been great. Um, but you know, the thing that maybe doesn't come through in all of the awards and in the, um, the professional resume is the way that Michelle um, has touched and continues to touch people's lives in ways that um, are profound uh, and in ways that affect not just not just this generation, but generations to come. I can't tell you how many times I've been stopped, and Michelle's probably been stopped as well, by people who said, hey, you know what? Um, I, I, that column that your wife wrote last week, uh, I clipped it, and I sent it to my grandson. Uh, and I know that nowadays it's emailing, but you know, again, I said various generations, and so people use their own methods. Um, so, but anyone who has read Michelle's columns and read, read her books and maybe is familiar with some of the media appearances that she's made, some of the many media appearances that she's made, um, would have to recognize uh, her, uh, her honesty, her forthrightness, and her compassion for, for people and uh, in those circumstances. Um, and um, uh, she genuinely has sincerely, sincere empathy for the people that, uh, that she writes about, writes to, they write back, and she responds uh, frequently uh, as time allows. Um, but for those of us who are here this evening, the many of us who are here this evening, who maybe know Michelle first uh, as something other than a journalist, maybe as a mother, sister, uh, friend, uh, a church ministry leader, and yes, as a, a wife, uh, uh, we know that she's just as straightforward, just as compassionate, just as honest in her personal life, in the way that we experience her as well. So know that she is a genuine person. What you see in the paper is what, what we get. <laughs> uh, so, Michelle, Sweetheart, I love you. We all love you. <laughs> and uh, on this day, we just couldn't be more proud today and every day for what you do. So, ladies and gentlemen, Michelle.
Well, my family already know. We'll try to get what I was crying here. It's it's never happened before, but let's see. Oh, please don't start playing music. Because I have a lot of people to um I want to first of all congratulate my fellow. Oh my when I saw the list, I was like, no, I can't be part of this group. <laughs> Such a wonderful distinguished. Um Particularly wonderful to be in the class with this woman. She is, I, I mean, I knew her when she was like 17. And she's just so wonderful. And I just, it's just an honor to be here with you. Um, I also want to thank the many professors at Maryland who inspired me and believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself including Professor Amanda uh, Maureen Beasley, who's just a wonderful person, and um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Olive Reed, who's always been in our corner, uh, and uh, Barbara Hines, who I know who couldn't be here tonight. And I want to tell you, it's really interesting, because my degree is actually not in journalism. <laughs> I was in the radio, television, and film program, which is now part of the school, but it was so interesting because I was in that school at a time where you did not, you did not do all of those things. It was either you had ink in your blood or you were in radio or TV. And we did not like TV people if you were a print person. I mean, it was just like, who are they? They just look pretty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so we were very terrible. But um, that's what's so wonderful about this school because they knew how important the multimedia was before it was even a thing and my goodness how that has benefited my career i can go from the post to cnn to abc to the day show to npr to podcast and all of that is because of the things i learned here at this school and i'm so grateful for that um i found refuge in the new Brewer cultural center i had to shout them out i mean that's where you went when you were black here at this school and you did not want to hurt somebody <laughs> and I'm so grateful for the late um, James Otis Williams, uh, who created that center and a place for us to go, and Anne uh, Carswell, who's still there now. And I'm just, you know, it, and, and they, the two of them encouraged me to run to be president of the Black uh, Student Union. It had been run by guys forever, and I won. Uh, and gets a ticket of all the Greeks, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and became the first black woman of that. Um, I'm so privileged to work alongside Monica Norton, who I understand was one of the folks who, who nominated me, and she's deputy managing editor of the Washington Post, and who I hope will be a future Hall of Famer. <laughs> um, so, what, what you might not know is that Monica Norton, Angela, and myself, I won a Baltimore Sun Scholarship to come to the University of Maryland. And it was a four-year academic scholarship, room, board, and book, and a summer pay job for four years. I mean, they don't even make that kind of thing anymore. And if you did well, you were guaranteed a job at either the evening sun or the morning sun. And that was an incredible opportunity. And I know that we, we wouldn't be here had it not been for that. Um, and, but can I be a little candid? I'm going to talk about two things about diversity and, uh, and, and, and not being, Angel talked about it, afraid to say yes to things. So we were not always respected as the interns at the Sun. We were treated different than the white interns. We were the black special interns like you know the short bus kind of joke over here uh and it made it difficult for us um and angela knows and because we were a family we got through that and look at us now <laughs> they say doing well is the best revenge and so when I see things like this, I say, hmm, see, y'all didn't think we could do it. You thought we would just somehow just got there because we were black, but look at us. Right? 
Um, so many fellow black journalists came through this school. And even though um, I worked on the Diamond Bat, it was the black explosion that was my home. And there I met Debbie Bar, I should say Barfield Barry, who was last year's uh, Hall of Fame inductee. And um, the editor in chief was Crystal Williams at the time. She's Chandler now. And some one of my best friends, uh, Alexa Still and David Still, worked for that. And it was just an amazing time. And also tonight, I want to thank three people in particular, my children, who have been the guinea pigs for my column for the entire life. <laughs> so Olivia, say hello, Olivia. Uh, Kevin, that's, that's, that's the favorite child. Don't even say you, do have, you always have a favorite child. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then Jillian. Where is she? Jillian. Yeah, yeah. Because when you're a journalist, you spend a lot of time out and about, and they just put up with me being gone quite a bit. And they also allow me to tell their stories. And that's, I think, the beauty of what we do is tell stories. And so, you know, I have to tell it, Olivia. I got to tell it. <laughs> I got to. Uh, <laughs> so one of the things my husband and I decided to do is we wanted to send all our children to school college debt free and we did all three of them debt free and she has a master's degree with no debt as well but one away yeah clap that's good and i do hope they take care of us in our old age <laughs> so when they were little one of the things that we told them to try to get them to stop asking for stuff is that you know listen we have Two words for you, college funds. So she's this one asking for stuff. Mommy, can I have my man? Can I have two words for you, college fund? Mommy, I know you got the money. Two words, I know, right? Two words for you, college fund. Mommy, mommy, all my friends have it. Two words for you, college fund. Heard that all their life. So this one, who is about seven or eight years old, she turns to me and she says, I have two words for you nursing home. <laughs> time to tell you all the stories but I'm so grateful to have so many of my family here they're all in the middle my sister my sister-in-law my uh my nephew his wife my niece um and our dear friends they out in the lobby Barbara and Malcolm and 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 my best friend Perry who I dragged through so many things at Maryland so many things in the journalism school in the rural center and she 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 fussed but she went um, but my heart will always be here at Maryland because that's where I met my man. And he's fine. He's so fine. Uh, and I appreciate all that he does to allow me to do what I do. And you know, when you have a good spouse and you have all these achievements and there was never any issue about that. He, he just was, he's just so wonderful. He's a mountain and he just, he supports all that I do. And I'm so grateful for that. But most importantly, I want to thank God because there was a time where I was angry at him for sending me to my grandmother, Big Mama. If there was a drill sergeant and a guardian angel and, you, and they had a baby, that would be my grandmother. <laughs> but she has been the inspiration for my column. I learned about money under her. This woman who, if she held a penny, Lincoln would scream. <laughs> Tom Stop Stopford, the playwright, said, I still believe that if you aim, if your aim is to change the world, journalism is a more immediate short-term weapon. My weapon of change has been sharing my grandmother's financial wisdom. It's never lost on me, even today, that hundreds and thousands of newspaper readers, radio listeners, and television viewers of every race and economic background are receiving life-changing personal finance information based on the teaching of a black woman who is the grandchild of enslaved individuals. One of the proudest days of my grandmother's life was, when, was watching me get a degree from Maryland. It is Big Mama's financial confidence that I channel every day in my work 
So I feel no shame in saying that I breastfed all three of them kids because the milk was free. <laughs> you know, you know they're gonna put me in a nursing home. You know they are. <laughs> As a woman of color to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, I can't help but reflect on the significance of this award. It speaks directly to the need to expand the diversity of voices at this school and at every level and in every area of journalism. No one else could be a Michelle Singleton. No one could write and do what I did, having grown up in inner city Baltimore with a grandmother who never made more than $13,000 a year. That's what we need, and I'm blessed to have had a long and prosperous career at the Washington Post. 32 years, even though I'm just 29. <laughs> you do the math. And I will say this, the one thing that I learned when I was in high school from my high school, high school counselor who asked me to apply for the Baltimore Scholarship, and I wouldn't do it. I said they wouldn't give a scholarship to this girl who was abandoned by her parents and raised by her grandmother, why would they give it to you, to me? And so she said, you know what? You need to apply. Because if you have a no now, if you get a no and you don't get it, you're still in the same place. She taught me that. And because of that, because, and winning that scholarship, I say yes. And I ask all of my kids to say yes. Because what? What do you lose? So tonight, receiving this award and being placed in the same company as my fellow Hall of Famers, women giants in journalism, I am honored beyond words. Thank you. So now you know why I call and ask for scholarship money. Finally, I want to introduce Professor Deb Nelson, who's going to talk a little bit about Dr. Lee Thornton. So um, when I left the newsroom for the classroom back in 2006, the college didn't really have any sort of onboarding program for making that transition. They just kind of threw you in the deep end. But good luck. Lee Thornton saved me. She took me on as my mentor. And what a mentor. Here was a woman of brains, wisdom, and grace who used all that to kick down gender and race barriers. First black woman to report from the White House for a major network for CBS and first to be dean at the university journalist and an educator. She was a trailblazer. But she didn't just do it for herself, she did it for others. For her students, we'll hear from one of them in a moment, um, and for her colleagues. One of her first orders of business after becoming the interim dean was kick-starting the promotion of three women faculty members, Susan Muller, Carol, Carol Rogers, and me. I found the email in my archives. It was classic Lee, coolly assessing the different obstacles facing each of us and strategizing how to work the levers of power and bureaucracy to break through them. In one of her last emails to me, long after she left the college, she was still guiding me through the final steps of my being named a professor. She passed six months later, but her good work has lived on. Marcelle Payne Gassaway, her longtime colleague and friend, will accept Lee's award. Marcelle couldn't be here, but Adrian Freeman, one of Lee's dear students, class of 03, and now an award-winning producer herself, will deliver during March.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It is beyond an honor to accept this award uh, on Marshall's behalf for Dr. T, which is what we called her. All right, special thanks to the Philip Merrill College of Journalism here at the University of Maryland, to all of those here to share in Dr. Lee Thornton's induction to the Merrill College's Hall of Fame. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge all of the inductees. Congratulations. Uh, I would also like to recognize the family, especially her sister here, Marilyn. Thank you for coming uh, on this special occasion, as well as, as those who are joining us online. I love y'all. Because today is not only a celebration of Lee and not only what she meant to all of us, but also to recognize how important she was to all of you. While Lee was quite private, please know that you all and Sir Newbie, her lovely dog, meant the world to her. Thank you, Deb Nelson, for those kind words. Where are you, Deb? There you go. <laughs> and um, I was given the honor some years ago, right after Dr. Uh, T passed, of producing her video for her memorial service. And now I'm given the honor to share in this moment as a tribute to her, as we recognize her outstanding accomplishments at today's induction. Again, Marcelle Payne Gassaway, the president of the Thornton Family Foundation, a foundation created at Dr. Thornton's wishes, was unable to be here and asked that I share a few words on her behalf. Dr. Th Dr. Thornton had a profound impact on institutional change, student success, and cultural shifts, not only at the University of Maryland, but also at a number of institutions, including Northwestern University, Michigan State, and Howard University. While I could go on and on about Dr. Thornton and her accomplishments, like being the first African-American woman to cover the White House, to traveling on Air Force One with a number of presidents, to her work at CNN, NPR, and CBS affiliate stations, and so much more, words cannot describe how she touched and changed the lives of so many. Whether it was through her work as a pioneer jur journalist, her leadership as a committed administrator, her lifelong commitment to mentorship and teaching, her candid conversations with colleagues, students, and friends, and I've had quite a few of those, <laughs> or just her sheer wittiness that was ever present. Dr. Thornton's legacy and impact lives on through those students that she educated, those faculty with whom she collaborated, and the countless number of individuals with whom she otherwise touched. I sat at the feet of Dr. Thornton while I was here, and it was an honor, and it was an amazing experience. I mean, she gave me and taught me so much about production, about news uh, journalism, and how to carry myself in and out of the newsroom, and I am forever, forever grateful for that. So again, thank you to everyone here today as we honor the incomparable Dr. Frances Lee Thornton, because we all know that she was one of a kind. Thank you so much. So let's have another round of applause for a phenomenal class. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. We'd love to have the honorees meet us by the wall outside in group photographs. Um, for everyone else, I'd like to mention a couple of upcoming events in Night Hall that we'd love to have you back for. Um, next weekend, Friday, April 12th from 5 to 7 p.m., we'll, we, during a Black Alumni Weekend, we will be host, hosting a Black Alumni Reception here in the building. At 5 p.m. on April 16, our Professor Sarah Oates, who I think is in here, but I can't see, um, <laughs> will be hosting a discussion with three of our alums who were on the ground, who have been on the ground covering the war in Ukraine. At 6 p.m. on Wednesday, April 26, the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism, Journalism will hold an event going behind the scenes of their recent reporting project for the Associated Press, Lethal Restraint on Deaths as a Result of Police Force that Wasn't Meant to Kill. Um, that project is out in the wild now. It will, um, there's 
that will continue for the next few weeks, and you'll see it on Frontline um, later in April. And on May 9th, for those of you who don't know, we will be hosting a book launch event and retirement celebration for Professor Ira Chinoy. 5 p.m. May 9th, great Ira Chinoy is uh, calling it for us. So hope to see you all again very soon. Appreciate so many people coming out. I looked around the room and I started to think I should call some of you out. And then I thought, I'm going to leave somebody out. So I won't do it. But we really appreciate you being here. Um, if you hurry out, you can still catch the bar open. Um, please hang out and chat with us and spend a little time in the uh, atrium. Thank you very much for coming.